good to see you in this lovely evening. Much nicer than I thought it was going to be. So, um, our speaker this evening is Lewis. And tomorrow morning, we've got the ladies' Bible study again. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. And that's 10 o'clock at Solent. Thursday, very important, church business meeting, 7.45 at Solent. That's 7.45 in the evening. In August, we're running a holiday Bible club. If anybody needs any more information, have a look on the table, please. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the evening service. I don't know about when you hear and see on TV hostels being bombed by the Russians in Ukraine, innocent people being killed. When you see the suffering in Gaza, when we see evil pervading in the world, when bad things happen to us, to our loved ones, we can question, why are you letting this happen, Lord? So I just want to read Psalm 96, which reminds us God reigns and is working out his purposes out in this world. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy to be praised, most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendour and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of the nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established, it cannot be moved. He will judge the people with equity. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the, the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest <coughs> sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth, he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Let's pray. We thank you that you are a great God who made heaven and earth and you reign. And Lord, I don't understand why you let the war in Ukraine go on. Uh, we've prayed many times that it might end and it just seems to be getting worse. But we know that you're, you, you have the big picture and you're working all things out for your purpose. Even when things in our lives don't work out, you're working it out all for our good. So we thank you for what a great God we serve and a great Saviour. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's sing our first song, Awake, Awake, Asylum. And it talks about our God reigns. So it fits in where you well. <laughs> Thank you. 
we come to a time of open prayer, um, let us remember Ukraine being continually being attacked by Russia. Pray for the war to be brought to an end. Lana, many know remember Lana, she's in Ukraine at the moment, visiting, <coughs> sorry, <I got> on. <coughs> visiting her family. But she's, she's not near the front line, but she's, as I'm looking on Facebook, I was hearing all the sirens going off, so she's still under danger of bombs. Please pray for her. That she, I think she's coming back on Friday. So pray that she'll come back safely. Uh, let's pray for the Gaza and Israel situation. There might be peace again there. Uh, let's also pray for Christianity Explored, been run by Abby. Let's keep praying for that because we need the Holy Spirit to work in those that are, are attending. Pray for Debbie and others that are going. And Uh, pray for the forthcoming holiday club being organised. Then I put pray for anything else that the Holy Spirit puts on your heart. So that's everything. So let's just pray. Father God, we know that you are in control of every situation and we thank you for your love and care for us. We were thinking in J-Squad this morning about the, about the, the heavens declaring your glory and the skies being the, the work of your hands and how we can see all the things that you've made for us and we thank you for them. Amen.
Lord, please work here in our state, God. And please help us to be part of this. Help us to know how to be uh, willing workers in your vineyard. Give us the words to speak. Give us the love for others to speak and to tell them. Uh, to want them to be saved. And give us faith that uh, it will happen. That you do save and you continue to save people in this country, including here. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father God, we can lift up to the holiday club, which will take place next month during the school holidays. We thank you, Lord, for the good news that there are already 18 children signed up, and they'll be coming in daily for several hours um, to have fun, uh, to have time learning about you, um, and to enjoy each other's company, to make new friends. And <coughs> for those who don't know you, the children for whom you are still a stranger in their eyes, um, Lord, that they will, um, uh, having come to know you during the holiday club, that it will be a good habit and be a habit that will um, start with coming to church on a regular basis. And uh, we thank you for all the hard work going on behind the scenes that started several months ago and is still going on. And we thank you for those who step forward to help run this event and to um, make it successful, hopefully. But we ask your blessing upon all the work being done in advance, Lord, and that it will be a time of um, a great blessing to those children who attend. Amen. Amen. Lord, we pray for this new government, Lord, we pray for Keir Starmer, Lord, we pray that, <laughs> it's a verse in the Bible, I couldn't find it earlier on, but it says that, um, it's the fact that you put, on the heart, you, put, you put on the hearts of kings what to do, something like that, Lord, we just pray, oh Lord, that you would put on the hearts of Keir Starmer to do good things, not bad things, and Lord, that uh, any evil legislation won't come to pass. Oh Lord, we do pray. And we pray for the situation in America. Uh, President Trump, Lee being assassinated. We pray for him, Lord, that you would bring him, that might remind him, Lord, that uh, he needs to come to know you. Lord, we pray. We pray for the whole election, Lord. Uh, it's, well, it's a minefield. But I just pray, Lord, that you, you would reign and put your will into action in America. And it all might turn out for the furtherance of the gospel. And I also pray for Lewis as he preaches, Lord, that you be with him and help him as he opens up 2 Samuel 6. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's sing our next song, Jesus Paid It All. I particularly like the last verse. When before the throne I stand complete in him, Jesus died my soul to save. My soul shall still repeat... It won't be, I've done good enough. Jesus paid it all. All, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. That's what we can say when we stand before him. Jesus paid it all. That's our only stand. So let's stand to sing, Jesus paid it all. <laughs> Thank you. 
Sue, to come up and read the scriptures. Thank you, Sue. is from 2 Samuel chapter 6, starting at verse 1, and it's on page 309 in the Church Bible. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala in Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahab, yep, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, tambourines, rattles, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the Ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irrever irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed Edom. Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women, and all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michelle, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michel, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people of Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes but by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honour. And Michelle, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Thank you, Sue, for reading that. Our next hymn is Holy, Holy, uh, often sung by Lou Fellingham. Uh, 
So we'll, have, we'll sing that song, then Lewis will come and speak God's word to us. Thank you, Sue, for reading. Thank you, Mark, for leading us uh, so far this evening. Well, uh, I, oh, are we on? Just wait. Am I on now? Can you hear me? Ah, oh, good. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm just looking around to see if there's anyone. Uh, so I'm Lewis, um, and so I was just, I can't help but wonder if, uh, given that I'm, I may be known amongst the people that preach here that I give shorter sermons, if there's a reason I was picked this evening. <laughs> I don't know. I have been told the sound is being cut off at half seven. So if I do ramble, uh, we'll just wrap it up quickly. Um, but no, seriously, it's, uh, it's great to uh, be here and to uh, speak to you tonight. Uh, when we first read this passage, I don't know how you feel about it, but perhaps on that surface reading, we feel something unfair has happened or is happening to a couple of the characters. Uh, at first glance, maybe it seems a little bit unjust uh, what happens to Uzzah. I mean, 
he was just stopping the ark from falling. And he's killed. Maybe you feel there's something wrong with uh, Mikhail's uh, fate. I mean, she reprimands her husband, the king, for acting unkingly. So, and she's left childless as a result of it. Maybe there's something that we recoil a little bit from about what happened to these people. Surely what they're doing wasn't so terrible. It might have been a mistake, but their fate seems rather harsh and, particularly in others' case, rather final. Uh, we're going to have a look at this passage, so please uh, have it open uh, and see if we can glean something helpful uh, from it. Uh, let me just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you that it can challenge us, that you speak to us through it. And even, even these stories from the Old Testament, they are about you. And as we come to know you, we can look at these and find out more about you, more about your character, and let that impact our lives. Help that to be the case tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to break this into probably about, well, I say probably about, I am going to break it into three headings. Uh, one, right intentions are not always good enough. Two, God's presence and power should not be taken lightly. And three, don't let pride hinder your zeal. But before we get into this particular passage, I want to take a little bit of a closer look at the Ark of the Covenant. It plays a central role in the story here. You can see straight away uh, in, at the beginning of this when he is David is gathering to bring the Ark of God and take it to Jerusalem. So we want to understand a little bit about what the Ark of the Covenant was and what it represented, some history around it. Now, maybe you're familiar with a rather highly accurate historical film, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Maybe that's where you've got some knowledge of what the Ark is. Mm, it's not the best source, so we want to look, well, what is the Ark of the Covenant? What happened to it? So I'll refer to a few passages. You don't need to turn to them uh, from the Bible, a much more reliable source uh, than George Lucas. So what do we know about the Ark from the Bible? It was commissioned by God. God called for the Ark to be created back in Exodus 25. It was a chest where they were to put the laws that God had uh, sent and they'd received through Moses. It was to be topped by a mercy seat, a place where God said he would come and meet with Moses. And it was to be kept in the innermost part of the tabernacle, hidden by a veil, unless it was being carried before the Israelites when they were traveling, which you can see in Exodus 40. It was not to be approached, even by Aaron, the high priest, it was not to be approached except on the Day of Atonement. And he would go in preparing sacrifices to atone for the sins of all the people. And even then it would be hidden by smoke. This was an extremely special and important artifact to the Israelites. But I want to be very clear, the ark was not God. The ark was not an image of God. They're forbidden for making images of God. It's not to be worshipped. The ark itself is not to be worshipped, but it's so closely linked in the Old Testament with the presence of God that it can be thought to represent the presence of God amongst his people. And before the passage tonight, before 2 Samuel 6, we see they're going to get it and return it. it had been captured by the enemies of Israel. We won't go into too much detail about that. We can save that for another sermon, maybe for Mike or Stephen. Um, but we just need to know, David is looking to bring the ark to its rightful place in Jerusalem. So he's gone to get it. 
So my first point, right intentions are not always enough. Have you ever heard someone say, wow, they meant well? You know, their heart was in the right place. It's often used to cover, uh, despite that apparent desire to do good, when something has gone wrong. A trivial example, perhaps someone has got uh, a stain on their favourite woolen jumper. And it's really special to them. And another member of their family, a loving member of their family, knowing how much that wooden jumper means, decide, I'm going to wash it. But they put it on quite a high heat in the wash. I just want to point out, this is just a hypothetical. This isn't something that I've done that's happened in the family. It's all hypothetical. They meant well. I meant well? No, they meant well. Their heart was in the right place. They wanted to do something right, something good, but they ended up doing something wrong. They didn't follow the instructions, in this case, on the jumper itself. Well, in the passage that we've just heard read to us, I think we can say that David and his men mean well. There's something that they're doing that feels like they're they want to do the right thing, all sort of. They mean well. Their heart's in the right place. Um, I want to point that out by, look at verse 3. They carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab. They wanted to go and get the ark, to bring it back to where it belonged. Great. They prepared a new cart. They set aside something to make this, well, this is going to be special. This is a special artifact. We want to set apart something, treat it in a special way. Sounds pretty sensible. They're praising God. Look further down. As they go, they're making merry. They're dancing, they're singing songs with l- and playing lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets, all in verse 5. They're praising God. They've set apart something special. They're bringing the ark back to its home. Surely, surely their heart is in the right place. Surely they mean well. But it doesn't turn out very well. God had given instructions regarding the ark. David and his men were supposed to know them. I mean, this was a relic that represented God's presence. It was so important to them. And when God's, uh, and here, where God's people are arranging its transportation back to the sanctuary, when we read about Aaron ministering before God, he has to stay behind a veil, hide the ark with incense smokes, and the consequence for not doing so, earlier on in Exodus, it says, lest he die. David and his men knew the consequence of treating the ark disdainfully, wrongly, irreverently, irrever- oh, I can't even say that word, without uh, reverence, that's the word. Um, so God gave them instructions for transporting the ark. It was the job of the Levites, and it was to be carried with two poles, put through the rings around the ark, and lifted by the Levites. It's not put on a cart. Even if that cart was specially made, that wasn't the instructions. And the Israelites had not followed the instructions. As they go, the cart bounces over some stones, maybe into a pothole. It's jostling the ark, and the ark nearly falls off. Azar steps in to stop it falling. Again, probably meaning well. He didn't want the ark, this precious relic, to fall and be damaged. And he didn't want the God it represented to be disgraced by it just falling out of the cart. But unlike the trivial example of a ruined jumper, this has fatal consequences. A man approaching the ark almost flippantly, reaching out, touching it, and being struck dead as a result. We cannot approach God on our terms. We cannot approach God 
on our terms. It's no coincidence, I think, that I found out Azza means strength. So we cannot lift God up in our own strength. Azza was trying to save the ark, almost as if he were trying to save God, or at least his dignity. But this was a situation brought about by not following the right instructions. I wonder if we ever try to lift up God, to save God amongst the people around us. I wonder how many times we've tried to make God a little more palatable to the people that we speak to, or at least in a way we think is more palatable to the people we speak to. But God doesn't need us to fight his corner. He doesn't need us to lift him up. God's given us instructions on how to approach him, and not following them is actually deigning to be above them. Like saying, oh, I don't care what the rules are. My way is good enough. But here's some wonderful news. The ark that we see in this story here, the ark that we talk about being representing the presence of God amongst his people, that's kept in that inner chamber no one can approach lest the power of God overcomes them, that ark has been replaced as the presence of God amongst his people. God himself came and became that presence, and in a much deeper way. He came into the world, and in his sacrifice, and the fulfillment of all sacrifices, he tore the veil, that means we can come before God, through his Son. God's instructions for being right with him are fulfilled in Christ Jesus. So that the instructions to us are to come to him through Jesus. What an offer. What an offer. And, and not one to be taken lightly as my second heading God's presence and power should not be taken lightly now we often think of God as good which is right we should we should think of God as good but we can see from this passage well this good God the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God struck him down because of his error verse 7 good doesn't mean safe and it certainly doesn't mean weak it first put me in, uh, in mind of how Aslan is described in Narnia if anyone knows that where they talk about As, uh, Aslan is this lion who represents God in the chronicles of Narnia and we get the line he's not a tame lion but he is good power of a lion, that danger of approaching a lion, but coupled with that we know that he is good. I'll paraphrase that slightly. Power and goodness in God go together here. Good does not mean weak, and weak cannot mean good. When we look at David's reaction in this passage, we can see the power and the goodness of God captured by them. Look at David's reaction. He's afraid. Verse 9, David was afraid of the Lord that day. And well, he might be. He's just seen as a being struck dead. But then, not far later on, God hasn't changed. It's still God. But we see God blessing Obed-Edom and David rejoicing. David joyful at the goodness of God. He is aware of the power of God, how dangerous it can be to approach him with, not on his own terms. And he sees the goodness of God, that when you are right with him, how amazing that can be. David's emotional responses of fear and joy are not paradoxical. They're both an appropriate reaction to the God of all creation. A psalmist speaks of serving the Lord with fear 
and rejoice with trembling. We both can and should be both fearful and joyful when we come before God. So consider what we said before, that we can come to God because he has made a way. Our instructions are to come to God through his Son. Just think how amazing that is, to come before God, the power and majesty of the creator of the universe making a way that we can come before him. And we can come before a holy God because he's done it himself. He's made that way. How we should marvel at that and not take it lightly. And so my last point is about David's response to God and how it was then met by Mikal, or however we're going to say her name. Now, Mikal, just to point out, you don't get it from this passage, Mikal was David's wife, but she's always referred to as the daughter of Saul in this passage, which we will think about in a moment. We are told in 1 Samuel that she loved David. So it's interesting that we start with this relationship But when she sees David dancing before God in a simple linen ephod, she looks down on him. She thinks it undignified. And not without reason. David is the king. He's dancing in a simple linen ephod uh, out on the street. Her comments to him drip with sarcasm. Is she justified? She's highlighting that his actions seem unkingly. But David's response is that he is king under God. Not because of his behavior. He's not king because he acts king. He's king because he is king under God and he is serving him. Perhaps that's why she's referred repeatedly as the daughter of Saul being linked to the old way of thinking. King Saul got things wrong. He was chosen because he looked like a king to the people. And this is a breaking away from that, that the new king would be a king under God. And David's reputation, this idea of looking kingly, is not what gives God power. It's not our reputation that's going to give God power today, which is why I say don't let pride hinder your zeal. David is not afraid of lowering himself in his worship of God. I wonder how this squares, though, with conduct yourselves well uh, amongst the people. I think we looked at that on at Life Group on Wednesday, conduct yourselves well Uh, amongst the people. So how can we link conduct yourselves well with potentially being lowered, putting ourselves in maybe a more humiliating situation? Well, it's by remembering that the way we act is not how we are saved. The way we act is to demonstrate God to the world around us. And God is not a middle-class British person, so your aim is not to conduct yourselves in what you think is acceptable to the people around you, to the people in our culture, but is to conduct yourselves in a way that will bring glory to God and rejoice in him. I wonder how many people might be rejoicing and maybe embarrassing themselves slightly tonight at the winning or losing of a football match? Well, how much more should we be joyful at being able to come into the presence of the living God? At the Holiday Bible Club over the summer, some people are going to be asked to dress up. They may be asked to act a little bit foolishly. But in order to present a message of God, a God of salvation to the children that are coming. To some that might seem degrading, but it's in service of God and the furthering of his kingdom. David 
danced before God. Not because it was the kingly thing to do, but because he was filled with passion, with zeal for the God he knows could save him, that was on his side. Is there something stopping you from serving God with that zealousness that he deserves? Our conduct before others should be whatever brings glory to God. It might not always look like the perfect upstanding citizen around the, uh, to the people around you. It cannot and should not be condemned as immoral. But remember, you are servants of God, like King David. Do not let pride hinder your zeal. So as we look at this passage at a whole, God has brought the, uh, or David has brought the ark of God back through the tragedy of Uzzah, through Michal being disdainful and sarcastic towards him. Perhaps the message of this passage is God's dignity is not at risk. And our dignity is not our salvation. God is all-powerful, and we should rejoice before him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that it is not our strength that lifts you up but your strength that brings us to you. Lord, we thank you that we see people like David with that passion for you, bringing himself down before the eyes of people around him because it's before you that he was worshipping, that he was praising. Lord, help us not to, not to be hindered by thinking about how others view us, but to serve you with that same passion, that same zeal, knowing that you are already strong and good and powerful and that you have brought us to you in order to serve you that way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There you go, Abby. It's before half seven. So let's stand to sing our last song, which I think is only a holy God. Let's stand and sing.
for this evening that we could come together and praise and worship you. Help us to take that passion, that zeal out with us into the world this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.